Right, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for your uh, patience. So my name is uh, Meng Junhu. I'm, uh, I was hired last, last year. I started last February. Um, I'm with the University of Maryland at the Department of Plant Science. I work with uh, grapes and small fruit. So I'm a uh, plant pathologist. So uh, very glad to be here to have this opportunity and to cover some basics for strawberry disease management and um, uh, grape bunch rot as well. Uh, the outline of my uh, talk, so we're gonna talk about some um, uh, our multi uh, multiple year uh, monitoring program um, of fungicide resistance in botrytis scenario and from strawberries, and then anthracnose crown and the fruit rot on strawberries. And at last, I will um, talk about some, um, uh, talk about lacing and bunch rot. Um, strawberry green mold, uh, the picture is not very advertising. Um, so the life cycle of green mold, I think it's very important. So the fungus can come with uh, transplants and it can also enter the field from, uh, for, from nearby small fruit fields, like blackberries, grapes, and uh, uh, the fungus typically start to infect flowers, I mean, when strawberries are flowering, and the disease will stay latent until the, uh, would stay, uh, stay latent until ripening of the fruit, and then the spores produced from the fruit will um, continue to infect other, small, uh, other, small, uh, other, uh, other healthy fruit. So uh, this slide, um, there are different kinds of active ingredients, chemical classes, fungicides that are labeled for strawberry gray mold management. And Botrytis scenario, the passaging of this disease um, is considered as a high risk passaging for fungicide resistance development. It has tremendous ability to develop fungicide resistance to different uh, chemical classes of fungicides, especially for single site fungicides. So there are two um, groups of fungicides, single site, right, the different fractals, and the multi-site. So compared to single site, um, multi-site is in general less effective and more toxic. However, multi-site is not prone to resistance development, whereas single site are uh, very prone to resistance development. We have found the resistance in botrytis um, in this passaging um, um, to, to all those single site fungicides. Now, um, just, just an example of, the, of um, the impact of fungicide resistance. So those berries treated with uh, pristine, right? And then inoculated with sensitive strain. And so um, the, the isolate was not able to, to infect and develop lesions on, small, uh, on strawberry fruit. However, if the same strawberry uh, fruit treated with a pristine and inoculated with resistant strain, it will develop, it develop um, um, lesions on the fruit. So this was a survey that we, we did back in 2014. So we collect a bunch of isolates from different strawberry fields. Uh, in, North and South Car in North Carolina and South Carolina. So it's, it was pretty interesting that the resistance profiles of those um, 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 isolates of those strawberry fields uh, varied from location to location. And CCR here stands for chemical class resistance. So five CCR uh, means that this isolate is resistant to five different chemical classes of fungicides. Now, um, so we can say that the, the resistant profiles of those locations are, are different. Based on, I mean, some locations had the more resistance issues, whereas some um, locations had, a, had a much less resistance issues. Based on this, uh, we initiated a uh, regional, uh, region-wide fungicide resistance monitoring program. Uh, this was a uh, program I was in charge of when I, when I was uh, uh, a postdoc at Clemson University. So we uh, used two 24 well plates that contained different active ingredients labeled for, um, for um, botrytis control at discriminatory dose that distinguish resistant and sensitive isolates. Now we ask our growers to send us samples, um, um, flowers. Um, flowers are highly susceptible to grain infection. Knowing what products would protect um, flowers would be the key to control grain mold. 
So when we get those flowers, uh, we process them in the lab and induce uh, spores from the uh, flowers and uh, transfer those spores to those pre-made um, um, uh, fungicide amended plates and uh, then um, identify resistance. So uh, I think some of you have been using this uh, monitoring program. Um, so what growers are getting, a, an email with summary of results and the personalized recommendations. So it's basically a uh, special, uh, sub, um, Location, it's a uh, location specific uh, recommendation based on, uh, based on results and the latest uh, uh, recommendations and efficacy table, not only for grain mold control, but also for other diseases uh, that include different, uh, some other active ingredients as well and a resistant, resistance profile results details uh, in a spreadsheet. So um, if you, you have been you know, using this, taking advantage of this monitoring program, keep doing that. I think this probably is the last year that uh, they offer the service for free. I mean, after this year, they probably will, will not continue. This program will not continue. So uh, if you wanted to have your uh, strawberry samples test for resistance, uh, send your uh, flower, uh, dead flower or leaf samples to Clemson. And later in the season, if you want to do uh, test uh, fruit samples, you can collect spores uh, using a swab and from the fruit and send the swabs to, um, to Clemson University. So a turnaround is usually about seven days after um, uh, they receive your samples. So this, uh, with this program, you can, you know, uh, it helps, <coughs> helps you identify uh, most effective fungicides for uh, for grain mold management. Now, in over years, we also by doing that over years, we have generated a lot of uh, research. I mean, data for our research interest. Um, the x axis are different active ingredients, and the y axis is a frequency of resistant isolates. Right, uh, siphonomethyl. That's the frequency of a uh, resistant to siphonomethyl over years. In the beginning, it was close to 70%, the frequency of resistant isolate, and they increased to 85%, and kind of stay there. And pyroxdrobin, that's a component in pristine, and also in marijuana. So um, it was 20% at the beginning, and they increased to 45%, and then uh, 65, 70% stay there. And for hexamide, that's an active, in, uh, active ingredient of Elevate. Uh, it was 10% at the beginning and increased to 20%, and then kind of stayed there. Boscalate, that's uh, um, 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 pristine, that's a component in pristine, right? And it was 10% and then increased to about 20%, and 10% kind of stay. You know, the frequency is between somewhere between uh, 10 to, to 25 percent, and then cyprodinyl, and very similar, it was 10 percent and increased to uh, 25 percent and stay there. Iprodion or iprodion, that's active ingredient of a rovera, right? So, fruitix onio um, probably is, a, is a, the active ingredient that had least resistance issues so far. That's the um, active ingredient of switch. So sensitive means that those, um, those are the uh, isolates that are completely sensitive to all those active ingredients we tested. So in the beginning, we had more uh, sensitive isolates and then it decreased. Uh, in addition to monitoring frequency of resistance to different active ingredients, we also look at um, multi-fungicide resistance in those same isolates. Again, CCR stands for chemical class resistance. Zero CCR uh, indicate that means that this isolate is sensitive to all those active ingredients we tested. And in, in the beginning, the majority of our, our isolates are um, or either zero CCR or one CCR isolates. And over years, we observed a shift towards multi-fungicide resistance. I will even have some, uh, we had some isolates that are resistant to seven different chemical classes of fungicides. 
So those are considered super strings. Um, so um, what's the, the molecular basis of resistance? Molecular basis of multi um, fungicide resistance. Basically, it's an accumulation of mutations in target genes of those um, uh, fungicides. For example, the, here are two, um, two isolates. Two isolates, isolate A and isolate B. And isolate A has this mutation in this gene. And this gene is a target gene of boscalid, right? And it's an accumulation of mutations in individual isolates. And you probably notice that the mutations in those uh, between those two isolates, some of them are not, not the same, which indicate that multi-fungicide resistance probably has evolved independently, right? And fluid, fluid exonial switch, the one that we currently, you know, the one is still very active, I mean, effective, not much resistance issues and very good efficacy against gray mold, and also it has some efficacy against the anthracnose fruit rot. And it has 48-hour kickback activity, and it's, it's kind of expensive. And the, the other component in this product, which is cyprodinyl, is, is falling because, um, a failing because of the resistance issues with the other um, uh, component, other active ingredient. Uh, however, if we, uh, um, you know, the increased usage will select for resistance. There are also some other newer uh, products, are newer FRAC7 fungicides, uh, SDHI fungicides, uh, such as Kenja. It has very uh, few uh, resistance issues because it's a, it's a, um, it's a new, new fungicide. And a very good efficacy against gray mode. And again, increased usage will select for resistance. And there are also some other um, FRAC7 fungicides, I mean, in the same group, Lula, Lula series, uh, Fantalis, Marivan. So uh, those, those fungicides, these are, you know, there are, have, have um, uh, much less risk, much less risk of fungicide resistance compared to other active ingredients that we um, tested. Um, so, just trying to make a conclusion before uh, we move on to a different topic. And now fungicide resistance, um, based on our monitoring, is, is pretty common. Pretty common to many frac codes, right? And resistance management recommendations need to be adjusted. We want to spray less frequently, right? We don't want to spray, uh, spray too often, too frequently. That will really uh, select for that will really speed up the um, uh, fungicide resistance selection. And we want to use primarily multi site fungicides, multi site fungicides, Captain, Siren, right? And limit each frac code to two applications per season. Again, we don't want to use, um, use the same, same, uh, same frac code more than two times a season uh, to, I mean, that this will help with ma uh, resistance management. And we wanted to avoid using single site fungicides alone, solely during critical stages. What are the critical stages? Bloom, right? Fruit ripening, those are two um, critical stages. We don't want to use single site fungicide by itself because uh, there is a risk that the, 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 the passing gene has already built up resistance to the single site. And you should always maintain continuous coverage of captain. Right, during those critical stages. And strawberry anthracnose, this one is another um, um, important fungal, uh, fungal disease. And there are two different um, species, called tachycan species, that cause anthracnose. One is called tachycan actatum. It primarily causes anthracnose fruit rot, but it also, it was also, it, it's also able to infect runners um, even crumbs and other parts of the, the plant. And it's very common. And the other one, other Clotachrican species, is uh, Clotachrican gallodiosporides. And it, it primarily causes anthracnose crown rot. Compared to uh, fruit rot, I mean, the uh, gallodiosporides crown rot is more serious, but um, um, I would say less common. Now, the disease cycle of architetin, right? 
Very similar to uh, botrytis, it can come with uh, um, transplants. And warm, warm and the wet conditions usually favor the disease development. And the disease normally do not show up until ripening of the fruit. And the spores produced from the leaching on the fruit will continue uh, to, to infect other healthy fruit. And the spores are, are dispersed by water splash. That's actatin. However, if we're talking about galodiosporides, galodiosporides is dispersed by wind. Galodiosporides has sexual stage, has both sexual stage and asexual stages. And actatin so far only asexual stage has been identified, no, no sexual stage. So in other words, if we're to deal with galodial sporadies, we would deal with both sexual and asexual stages. So although they're all cotatrican, but they behave, behave differently. I uh, just wanted to point out. And those are the fungicides, uh, effective fungicides for anthracnose control, all right? However, I mean, you know, those, uh, uh, those ones, FRAC11, that's the primary fungicide for anthracnose control, strobilurins. It has a very good efficacy. However, resistance to FRAC11 is very common. I would say 50% of cotatrican actin isolates that are resistant to FRAC11. So what your options? Switch, Captain? Probably those are the two options, only two options uh, for anthracnose control. But the, it has some efficacy. Those two fungus I have some efficacy, but less effective compared to uh, FRAC11. And this slide probably does not affect, uh, fit very well here because those species were from peaches, okay? But those are the same, you know, Clotatrican gallodial sporadis acutatin, right? Also cause strawberry anthracnose. I wanted to point out that those two species actually are species complexes. It has, which means that there are multiple, there are different species under each complex. Those are the species that we found on peaches. Under gallodial sporadies, we have a Clotatrican thiomancy, Clotatrican fruticola, and by the way, uh, those Clotatrican species are also, I um, mean, cause bitter rot on apples, right? So, thiamensi, uh, we found the resistance. Some of those cotatrin thiamensi, we found the resistance to both FRAC1 and FRAC11. FRAC1, that's a siphonomethyl. Uh, FRAC11, strobilurins, right? We have uh, found the resistance in, in this species, but not in cotatrin fruticola. And under cotatrin actatin, there are three different cotatrin species, actatin species, lymphae, Fiorini and the Fiorini like. And it's noteworthy that those, um, you know, those species, cotatrin actin species, they are inherently resistant to, to siphonomethyl, to FRAC1 fungicide. And the last one, clotatrican truncatin, which is uh, less common, but this one inherently resistant to, um, to most. FRAC7 fungicide, what are the FRAC7 fungicides? Those are um, SDHI fungicides, Marivan, Pristine, uh, Fontalis, I mean, those are FRAC7 fungicides. So if, you, if you're dealing with this species, you definitely wanna avoid using any of those uh, FRAC7 fungicides. So um, we will also um, uh, try to look for um, other, other FRAC codes that might be effective against those Cotatrican species, right? And there are, we tested, uh, um, um, ECF, uh, we evaluated, we determined the EC50 values of those different species to different FRAC3 fungicides, try those, DMI fungicides, uh, including Defenconazole, Propiconazole, Metoconazole, Tepconazole, Flutrifero, and the Femboconazole. And uh, the X axis of the uh, figure, those are different Cotatrican species, and the Y axis is a, uh, the EC50 value. So uh, the higher the bar is, then the less effective the fungicide is. 
it's, uh, it was, it's pretty interesting that the differential, we found the differential sensitivity of those cortical species to the same FRAC3 fungicide, right? Can I say that, um, um, uh, for example, um, polyconazole and the diphenconazole, um, based on the in vitro um, sensitivity analysis, those two fungicides, those two FRAC3 fungicides are effective against all cortical species that we tested. However, if you look at uh, flu trifluoro and the fenbaconazole, those two are not effective against truncate and lymphae. Uh, to summarize, uh, I mean, uh, we got uh, resistance issues with, to, uh, with FRAC1 and FRAC11 in Clotachrin Siomense, right? And this table summarizes the sensitivity of different Clotachrin species two different FRAC3 fungicides, which indicate that it's very important to know the species that you're dealing with so, so that we can better identify um, um, fungicide, effective fungicides for disease control. And all right, I'm going to uh, move on to a uh, late season bunch rot. So I also work with, uh, with grapes. Um, in Maryland, most of the grapes are, are wine grapes but we, have, we also have some table grapes. They say then bunch rot has been identified as a major threat in Maryland vineyard. And so it, you know, the they say then bunch rot re refers to multiple fungal diseases, not fungal diseases, diseases in general that occur late in the season. It's, a, it's an umbrella term of those diseases occurred late in the season. Okay, and one, one disease under this umbrella is Botrytis bunchy rot, caused by Botrytis scenario, the same, the same uh, passaging causing strawberry green mode, okay? And it often occurs after, after I mean, um, close to harvest, the disease. And uh, the control of Botrytis largely relies on fungicide, uh, fungicides, but again, the resistance is, a, is a very common uh, in Botrytis. Uh, fungicides, Captain Switch, Kenja, Nuna Experience, those are the good ones. I mean, those are the ones that have uh, less resistance issues for grain mold control. And then ripe rot. Ripe rot is caused by Cortatrican species. Now we have found both Cortatrican acutatin and Galodiosporides uh, from grapes in, in Maryland vineyards. And the symptoms include berry, berry shriveling and the browning and the black specks. Uh, on the surface of the fruit, and it overwinters in mummified fruit or plant debris, and again, it's dispersed by, by water splash and or by wind. It depends on which passenger. So infection can occur any time from bloom to harvest. And sour rot. Now sour rot is characterized by sour smell. A smell, you know, not not so uh, so pleasant, and considered to be a disease complex consisting of insect damage, fruit flies specifically, and bacteria and the fungal infections. So there have been uh, some some studies that showed the the benefit the benefit of uh, controlling fruit flies after uh, 15 breaks uh, for sour rot control. And there are also other latent rots and in association with secondary pathogens such as Atlaria, Aspergillus, and the uh, Penicillium. Uh, we, we don't know if those secondary, I mean, those are the, uh, the pathogens that we, we sometimes can, I mean, isolate from those late season rot samples, but we don't know if those secondary pathogens are able to initiate infections. Uh, we need to understand more um, regarding the role of those secondary pathogens. So, um, grape has pretty pretty long season, growing season, right? And it's threatened by multiple pathogens. We really need to know um, what are the threats, what are the fungal, uh, what are the diseases at the different stages. Now, between bud break and post bloom. Uh, high black rod pressure, high black, I mean high pressure of formosis, and the powder mildew and the downy mildew, I mean in our area, powder mildew is not a big concern. 
And downy mildew is kind of a, uh, uh, I mean, a issue throughout the season. It's a, it has constant, we have constant pressure of downy mildew throughout the season. For botrytis, for gray mold, uh, critical, critical um, uh, timing, bloom, bunch closure, uh, verizon, and pre-harvest. So uh, we need to really um, know what we, um, in the, the timing of those um, um, infections and the disease occurrences so that we can better, uh, be better choose fungicides and control the disease. With that, I'd uh, like to take any questions. Yes. Can we send you a grape sample, like the strawberry sample? Uh, for resistance test, you are welcome to send a sample to um, to Clemson, Clemson University. I can give you more instructions if you are interested. So that it is same, same okay. Yeah.